all living things, there are four important classes of large biological molecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. These molecules are important in chemical processes in the cell. In this lecture, we're going to cover how macromolecules are built and break down the structure and function of all four classes of large biological molecules. Let's get started. I mentioned there are four classes. Only carbohydrates, proteins, and nucleic acids are known as macromolecules, which consist of polymers. Lipids is slightly different in that they are defined by a property rather than by their chemical structure. A polymer is a long molecule consisting of many similar monomers that are linked together by covalent bonds. Recall what covalent bonds are, a strong chemical bond in which one or more pair of valence electrons are shared. These repeating units are the building blocks of a polymer, and they are called monomers, or subunits. Now, each of these polymers is made up of a different type of monomer, but the way cells make and break down polymers are basically the same, and these processes are facilitated by enzymes, which are specialized macromolecules that speed up chemical reactions. We cover how and why in the enzymes lecture. So let's go through how polymers are synthesized. Monomers, or two molecules, are connected together via a condensation reaction. And this reaction involves two molecules covalently bonded to each other. If a water molecule is lost, this is known as a dehydration reaction. Each monomer contributes a part of the water molecule that is released during the reaction. So between these two monomers that are combining, one monomer provides the hydroxyl group, while the other provides a hydrogen. And so this reaction is repeated as new monomers are added to the chain, and we make a polymer. Now, to break down polymers into monomers, this is done by hydrolysis, the reverse of the dehydration reaction. We're going to hydrate the polymer and break the bond between monomers. Because this process is the reverse of the dehydration reaction, the hydrogen from water is going to attach to one monomer and the hydroxyl group is going to attach to the other. Hydrolysis occurs when we digest food. The organic material in our food is in the form of polymers that are massive. And so in our digestive tract, enzymes will attack the polymers, okay? And hydrolysis occurs releasing monomers that are then absorbed into the bloodstream. So now let's subtract complexity and break down the four important classes of large biological molecules, starting with carbohydrates, which provides a source of energy and make up the cell wall in bacteria, algae, and plants. Carbohydrates include sugar and polymers of sugar. The simplest carbohydrates are the simple sugars or monosaccharides. These are the building blocks which more complex carbohydrates are built. So carbohydrates are polymers of simple sugars. Disaccharides are double sugars, two monosaccharides two monosaccharides joined by a covalent bond. And carbohydrate macromolecules are polymers called polysaccharides, many sugars. The most common monosaccharide, which you know, is glucose. Now, monosaccharides has a carbonyl group and multiple hydroxyl groups. We covered the different types of chemical or functional groups in the carbon lecture. Okay, essentially, monosaccharides has a carbonyl group and multiple hydroxyl groups. Now, depending on where the carbonyl group is, a monosaccharide is either an aldose, an aldehyde sugar, or ketose, a ketone sugar. Aldoses have their carbonyl group at the end of the carbon skeleton, and ketoses have their carbonyl group within the carbon skeleton. For example, glucose is an aldose. The carbonyl group is at the end of the carbon skeleton. And fructose, fructose is a ketose. Fructose is actually an isomer of glucose, so they have the same molecular formula, same number of atoms, but differ in their arrangement but differ in the arrangement of their atoms. We can also classify monosaccharides based on the size of their carbon skeleton, between three to seven carbons long. For example, glucose and fructose have six carbons, so they are called hexoses. Glucose is very important in cells because it serves as a source of fuel, and we talk about this in the metabolism lecture, as well as in the cellular respiration lecture, okay? Now, I mentioned earlier in the lecture how monomers serves as the building units for forming polymers. 
In this case, monosaccharides, specifically their carbon skeletons, are involved in the synthesis of other small organic molecules, such as fatty acids and amino acids. We can also use monosaccharides to form disaccharides or polysaccharides. A disaccharide consists of two monosaccharides, two simple sugars, joined by a glycosidic linkage. Okay, how are they joined? Through covalent bonding via a dehydration reaction. A common disaccharide is maltose or malt sugar, which is used in brewing beer. Maltose consists of two glucose molecules joined by a glycosidic linkage. Another example is lactose, the sugar present in milk. Lactose is the combination of glucose and galactose. Lactose intolerance is really common in individuals who lack the enzyme lactase, which breaks down lactose. So lactose is broken down by intestinal bacteria, which results in subsequent cramping and the formation of gas. Okay, now in order for organisms to use disaccharides as fuel, it needs to be broken down into monosaccharides first. So the reverse process of a dehydration reaction, which is hydrolysis, hydrating the polymer. Now, if we add multiple units of monosaccharides, we form polysaccharides. Again, these monosaccharides are joined by glycosidic linkages. Some polysaccharides serve as storage material, known as storage polysaccharides. For example, plants store starch as granules within plastids, which are cellular structures. Starch can then be broken down later to use as fuel when the plant requires energy. Other polysaccharides serve as building material for structures that protect the cell. These are called structural polysaccharides. For example, cellulose in plant cell walls, or chitin, which is the carbohydrate used by arthropods, so insects, spiders, and crustaceans, to build their exoskeleton. In fungi, they also use chitin to build their cell walls. The difference between cellulose and chitin is chitin has a nitrogen group attached to the glucose monomer. Okay, so that is carbohydrates. Let's now move on to the next class, which are lipids. Lipids are extremely important because they make up cell membranes. They store energy and act as signaling molecules. The reason why lipids are not considered macromolecules is because they are not big enough and they do not include true polymers. Compounds that are classified or classed as lipids are hydrophobic or water fearing, which means they do not mix well with water. This is due to their molecular structure, which consists of hydrocarbons and they are nonpolar, meaning they don't have regions of positive or negative charges, so they don't readily react to other polar molecules such as water. In this lecture, we're going to break down three different types of lipids fats, phospholipids, and steroids. Let's begin with fats. Fats are not polymers, okay? A fat consists of one glycerol molecule joined to three molecules of fatty acids. Glycerol is an alcohol, and each of its three carbons linked to a hydroxyl group. And a fatty acid is a long carbon skeleton. The reason why it's an acid is because at one end of the skeleton, it's part of a carboxyl group, and the rest is a hydrocarbon chain. And these fatty acids can all be the same, or they can be two or three different kinds. And due to its nonpolar carbon and hydrogen bonds in the hydrocarbon, fats are hydrophobic, which is why fats don't mix well with water, because water molecules hydrogen bond with one another, leaving the fats alone, okay? Water molecules are polar, which means they have regions of positive and negative charges, so they interact with other polar molecules. And because hydrocarbons don't have areas of positive or negative charges, they're not going to interact readily with other polar molecules because they don't have charge. So how are fats synthesized? Each fatty acid molecule is joined to a glycerol by a dehydration reaction, and an ester linkage is formed between a hydroxyl group 
and a carbonyl group. And fats are also called triglyceride or triglycerol, okay? Now, the structure of the hydrocarbon chains can be termed saturated or unsaturated fats. If the hydrocarbon has no double bonds present between the carbon atoms, this is a saturated fatty acid because the hydrocarbon tail can maximize the number of hydrogen atoms bonded to the carbon skeletons. At room temperature, saturated fat like butter is solid because the molecules of the saturated fat are packaged closely together. Now, if the hydrocarbon tail has one or more double bonds between the carbon atoms, then this is an unsaturated fatty acid because double bonds reduce the number of hydrogen atoms attached to the carbon skeleton. At room temperature, molecules of an unsaturated fat aren't packed together closely because of the kink, which is why they can't solidify. Almost all double bond in naturally occurring fatty acids is a cis double bond, which creates a dint or a kink in the hydrocarbon chain. And there's also trans fat, which is an unsaturated fat formed artificially, which contains one or more trans double bond. This occurs during hydronation of oils, okay? So those are fats. The next type of lipids are phospholipids. Phospholipids are very important in cells because they are major components of cell membranes. They are similar to fats, but instead of three fatty acids attached to glycerol, only two fatty acids are attached. The third hydroxyl group of glycerol is linked to a phosphate group, which has a negative electrical charge in the cell. Sometimes there are small polar molecules that is also linked to the phosphate group, such as choline. The structure of a phospholipid consists of a polar head or hydrophilic head, water-loving, because of the electrical charge, and two hydrophobic or non-polar hydrocarbon tails. Again, hydrocarbons, they're non-polar because they don't have regions of positive or negative charges. Therefore, when phospholipids are added to water, they're going to form, okay, they form into a double-layered sheet called a bilayer that protects their hydrophobic tails from water. The bilayer, the phosphid, phospholipid bilayers, forms a wall between the cell and its external environment, okay? That's phospholipids. Another type of lipids are steroids. The carbon skeleton of these lipids consists of four fused rings, and they vary in the chemical groups attached to the rings. A type of steroid is cholesterol. It's an important component of cell membranes in animals, and it's also the molecule from which sex hormones are synthesized. Cholesterol is synthesized in the liver, and it's also obtained from the diet. All right, so that's lipids, which are hydrophobic molecules, and the three types that we covered are fats, phospholipids, and steroids, okay? The next class we're gonna break down are proteins, which provide structural support and act as catalysts that facilitate chemical reactions. There are different types of proteins that have different functions. Enzymatic proteins, which speed up chemical reactions, storage proteins, defensive proteins that protect the cell against disease, transport proteins, receptor, hormonal proteins which coordinate an organism's activities, structure proteins which provide support, and some proteins are involved in movement, contractile and motor proteins. And you're going to learn more about these different types of proteins in later lectures. Now, one of the most important type of protein are enzymes which regulate metabolism, all the chemical reactions by acting as catalysts. Catalysts are chemical agents that speed up specific chemical reactions without being consumed in the reaction. We go through this in more detail in the enzymes lecture and how this all works, but essentially proteins are all made from the same set of 20 amino acids linked in unbranched polymers. Proteins are polymers of amino acids and the bond between amino acids is called a peptide bond. They are joined by a dehydration reaction, so a water molecule is removed. A protein is made up of one or more polypeptides, which are folded and coiled into a specific 3D structure. So let's break down the structure of an amino acid. All amino acids share a common structure. It's absolutely beautiful, okay? An amino acid is an organic molecule because it contains a carbon, and it has an amino group and a carboxyl group. The center carbon here is called an alpha carbon, and it's asymmetric. Another component 
is it has a side chain represented here by R. Now the R group or side chain differs with each amino acid. The R group can be a hydrogen atom or it may be a carbon chain or skeleton with different functional groups attached to it. Beautiful. The components of the side chain determines the properties of a particular amino acid, which will influence its functional role in a polypeptide. We can group amino acids according to their characteristic. One class of amino acids have non-polar side chains, so they are hydrophobic. Another class has a polar side chain, so they are hydrophilic or water-loving. The function of a protein is due to its specific 3D structure, and the amino sequence of each polypeptide is what determines its 3D structure. Many proteins are spherical, and they are called globular proteins, or they are shaped like long fibers, giving them the name of fibrous proteins. Let's briefly go through protein structure. We're going to cover this in more detail in another lecture where we'll just focus on protein structure and function. Okay? There are four levels of protein structure, known as primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. The fourth level, known as quaternary structure, occurs when a protein has two or more polypeptide chains. Let's go through primary structure. The primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. Now, this isn't random linking or combination of amino acids. This is inherited genetic information. Absolutely incredible. The primary structure then determines the secondary structure, which involves alpha helices and beta pleated sheets, as well as the tertiary structure. This is because of the backbone and the R groups of amino acids along the polypeptide. The secondary structure involves coiled or folded patterns in the polypeptide chains, and the coils and fold are referred to as secondary structure. How does this occur? Let's go through this. Within the backbone, the oxygen atoms have a partial negative charge. They are electronegative. And the hydrogen atoms attached to the nitrogens have a partial positive charge. Polar molecules like polar molecules. And so these hydrogen can form hydrogen bonds between these atoms. If you recall, hydrogen bonds are weak, but because there's so many of them, they can support a particular shape for that part of the protein. There are two types of secondary structure. We have alpha helix, which is a coil held together by hydrogen bonding, and the hydrogen bonds can be found between every fourth amino acid. And the second structure is the beta pleated sheet. In this type of structure, there are two or more regions of the polypeptide lying side by side, just chilling, side by side, called beta strands. And they are connected by hydrogen bonds. They're lying side by side, just holding hands, hydrogen bonds. And this leads us to tertiary structure. The tertiary structure is the overall shape of a protein or polypeptide chain. And this is due to the interactions between the R groups or side chains of the amino acids. One interaction is called a hydrophobic reaction. This is where amino acids with nonpolar side chains end up in clusters at the core of the protein. The opposite of this also helps stabilize the tertiary structure, hydrogen bonds between polar side chains and ionic bonds between positively and negatively charged side chains. And another interaction are disulfide bridges, which are covalent bonds that form between two cysteine monomers, which have thiol or sulfur hydryl groups. Okay? There are also some proteins that have two or more polypeptide chains that come together to form one functional molecule. And this is where the quaternary structure comes in. Let's go through this. Quaternary structure. This is the overall protein structure when two or more polypeptide chains combine. An example is collagen, which is a fibrous protein that has three identical helical polypeptides forming into a large triple helix. It accounts for 40% of the protein in our body. So to sum this up, okay, let's sum up protein structure. What determines protein structure? The amino sequence of a polypeptide chain can be coiled and folded into a 3D shape, and this determines the function and unique properties of a protein. Okay? Physical and chemical conditions of the protein's environment also impacts protein structure. If the pH, temperature, or salt concentration changes, protein shape may be broken, and this is called denaturation. 
and the denatured protein is biologically inactive because like we mentioned before the sequence the structure of a protein is what determines its function and so if the environment changes and it breaks the overall shape of a protein it's useless we, we can't do anything with it anymore so it's biologically inactive okay so if the primary structure of a polypeptide determines a protein shape and function let's step back and take a look at what determines primary structure because I mentioned before that the sequence of amino acids is not random, it's inherited genetic information. And this is where the last class of large biological molecules come in, nucleic acids, which encode and transmit genetic information. A basic unit of inheritance is known as a gene, and this is what determines the amino acid sequence of a polypeptide. And genes consist of DNA, which belongs to the class of biological molecules called nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are polymers of monomers called nucleotides. Now, there are two types of nucleic acids. We have DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, and RNA, or ribonucleic acid. Let's break down the components of nucleic acids. Polymers of nucleic acids are called polynucleotides. A nucleotide consists of a 5-carbon sugar, a pentose, a nitrogen-containing base or nitrogenous base, and one to three phosphate groups. Now, two phosphate groups are lost during the polymerization process, and the region of a nucleotide that doesn't have any phosphate groups is called a nuclear side. Let's break down the structure of a nucleotide even further, beginning with the nitrogenous bases. Each nitrogen-containing base has one or two rings that include nitrogen atoms. The reason why they are called nitrogenous bases is because the nitrogen atoms tend to take up protons from solution and so it acts as a base, nitrogenous base. There are two families of nitrogenous bases, pyrimidines and purines. A pyrimidine has one six-membered ring of carbon and nitrogen atoms. The members of the pyrimidine family are cytosine, thymine and uracil. Purines, on the other hand, are larger, with a six-membered ring fused to a five-membered ring. The purines are adenine and guanine. The specific pyrimidines and purines differ in the chemical groups attached to the rings. Okay, Adenine, guanine, and cytosine are found in both DNA and RNA. Thymine is found only in DNA and uracil only in RNA. Okay, so that's the nitrogenous space. Let's add the sugar to which the nitrogenous base is attached. In DNA, the sugar is deoxyribose, and in RNA, it's a ribose. The only difference between these two sugars is that deoxyribose lacks an oxygen atom on the second carbon in the ring, hence the name deoxyribose. All right, now we have a nitrogenous base and sugar. This is the nucleoside of a nucleotide. To complete this, the formation of a nucleotide, we attach one to three phosphate group to the five prime carbon of the sugar. So the carbon numbers here in the sugar include the prime symbol, okay? So we've built a nucleotide. How are then nucleotides linked into a polynucleotide? Let's break this down. This involves a condensation reaction. Nucleotides are joined by a phosphodiester linkage, which consists of a phosphate group that covalently links the sugars of two nucleotides. This bonding results in a repeating pattern of sugar phosphate units called the sugar phosphate backbone, and the nitrogenous bases are not part of this backbone. So this here, okay, this is the sugar phosphate backbone. Now, the two free ends of the polymer are distinctly different from each other. One end has a phosphate attached to a 5' prime carbon, and the other end has a hydroxyl group on a 3' prime carbon. We refer to these as the 5' prime end and the 3' prime end, respectively. Okay, So the polynucleotide is built from 5' prime to 3' prime. The bases are attached all along the sugar phosphate backbone. Now looking at DNA here, a DNA molecule has two polynucleotides or strands that wind around an imaginary axis forming a double helix. The two sugar phosphate backbones run in the opposite 5' to 3' direction. 
and the sugar phosphate backbones are on the outside of the helix, and the nitrogenous bases are paired in the interior of the helix. The two strands of the double helix are complementary. In base pairing, only certain bases in the double helix are compatible with each other. Adenine in one strand always pairs with thymine in the other, and guanine always pairs with cytosine. This whole mechanism is what allows the cell to create two identical copies of each DNA molecule that is preparing to divide. And another type of nucleic acid is RNA. RNA molecules exist as single strands. And in RNA, adenine pairs with uracil and thymine is not present in RNA. Okay, and that concludes this lecture on organic molecules. In this lecture, we learned that there are four different classes of large biological molecules. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Lipids are not considered a macromolecule because they are not big enough. We covered how macromolecules are synthesized and broken down, and the structure and function of each class of large biological molecules. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating.